Hey everyone, Sadat here with another Monster Hunter Rise video. In this video, we'll talk about all of the best new sets for Monster Hunter Rise 3.0. This is super exciting because this latest update introduced so many weapons, uh, some of which are elemental, which no one on the internet seems to like doing the math for. So I guess that's what I do. Anyways, um, before I get started, just a quick note which I didn't mention too much in my last video. All of these builds I'm recommending are built with a quick sheath 2 talisman with two, two slots. These charms are relatively rare, so you might not have one. Uh, if you don't, generally the easiest thing to drop is a point of crit boost. If you want a quick sheath 2 charm, the best method to actually get those charms turns out to be using Moonbow Melding. Uh, where you can actually select which abilities you get. The game thinks that Quick Sheath is a really bad skill, and thus it lets you select it with a decent high probability. So if someone else did the math then, I think it was in about 50 hunts, you're likely to have gotten a Quick Sheath 2-2-2 two, two, two charm. So yes, um, while you're playing through 3.0, or grinding to actually get the armor pieces or weapons for these builds, I'd recommend you do some moonbow melding to get some quick sheath charms. Anyway, now for the builds. So the best raw and general use longsword in version 3.0 is now the Camellia's longsword, the Phantom Mirage. So this is the upgraded form of the Mirage Fin Sword from last patch, and this is now better in every way than the Tigre Need that used to be considered the best. Even taking into account that weapon's ramp up skill. I have shown two builds for the Phantom Mirage on screen now. So one of them uses Protective Polish to maintain wide sharpness, and the other uses Master's Touch. The Protective Polish build has slightly more damage than the Master's Touch build, since the Master's Touch build needs an extra bit of Handicraft to maintain wide. But yes, um, I personally use the Protective Polish build, and if you want even more sharpness, you can swap a Crit Boost Decoration for another Protective Polish Decoration for a total of 90 seconds of white over each sharpening. Now, that's the boring stuff out of the way that anyone can tell you, so let's go into the more interesting stuff, the elements. So, for fire, if you pay attention to my last video, you'd know that Wyvern Blade Maple was incredibly strong. And it still is. So, it is still optimal against quite a few monsters, namely Camellios, Apex Arzuros, Foster Rag, Kezu, and Great Baggy, and it's still pretty decent against Baron. Uh, but in the last video, I recommended making both elemental exploits and attack up longswords. Uh, now we're just with how much stronger the raw options are. The attack ramp up isn't that useful, except against Apex Arzuros. So if you are going to just build one, make sure you build elemental exploit. However, if you are going to build two, could also build three <laughs> because Wyvern Blade Maple has access to a third really strong ramp up, uh, which is from when it's a Rathian longsword, you can get small monster exploit, which boosts your damage by 50% to small monsters. So, if you really want to kill small Jagras, you can actually get the small monster exploit ramp up if you really want to. Oh, but we do get one additional new Fire Longsword, which is actually pretty good as well and has its own use cases. And that is Kamura's Inheritance, which is the final form of the Hand-Me-Down Sword. Now the reason this Longsword is so good is that it starts off with really high base affinity and can hit wide sharpness with just one point of Handicraft. But most importantly, you can ramp up with Anti-Aquatic Species, which increases the raw damage by 10% against Aquatic Monsters. Now, it's not good against all Aquatic Monsters. Uh, this sword does rely a bit on its fire damage, so it's not going to be that good against the Mizutsunes or Jirotodus. But against the other four Aquatic Monsters, that is Almadron, Somnikanth, Tetradon, and Royal Ludroth, Kimura's Inheritance is actually optimal. Uh, this build is actually pretty free. Uh, you can actually change the headpieces with a few different options. I chose the skull because I like Fortify, because 
sometimes I die. Um, but you can change it for something else. Just check out a set builder for the key skills uh, that you see on the screen. And also, you can forego speed sharpening for more fire attack. But in this case, the fire isn't actually that high. You are still relying mostly on your roll. So I'd rather get the rapid sharpening and have more protective polish uptime. Anyways, so that's the fire. Now, for water and thunder, we got new longswords. We got the Mizutsune and the Rajang longswords, respectively. Unfortunately, both of those longswords aren't actually useful. And honestly, I'm pretty disappointed at that because I love the designs of them. But unfortunately, they are not worth using. If you do want to use them, you can. Just for fun, with the Rajang longsword, you can get wide sharpness with four points of handicraft. And with the Mizutsune, you can get wide with, I believe, two. But they'll just never beat the raw options, unfortunately. But the other two elements are really, really good. The newest Ice Longsword, they always rain. So this Longsword is amazing. Um, this is actually incredibly overtuned. So this Longsword is good for a few reasons. Uh, the first is that it has a native Y sharpness. Only 10 hits, but it means you don't need to slot in Handicraft. The second is that it has really, really high numbers. But finally, it has probably one of the best ramp-up skills in the game, which is Kushala de Orasol. So Kushala de Orasol is basically like Chain Crit from the previous games. When you land hit, your next few hits will have 25% more affinity, so long as you don't stop hitting the monster for, I believe it's three seconds. If you hit the monster a lot, without the timer going it down, it actually increases to 30%. Uh, because of this, you get some really, really good matchups, because there are actually a lot of ice weak monsters in this game. So it's optimal against the Diabloses, both Apex and Normal. It's optimal against Rajang, Ragnar Kadaki, Bishaten, Volvodon, and Great Rogi. It can also be optimal against Valstrax, but Valstrax is a bit weird with its varying ice weaknesses. And outside of that, depending on how good you are with landing or Spirit Helm Breakers, it can still be really, really good against Teostra, Puke Puke, and normal Arzurus. Uh, just to note that this build does use the Valstrax Braces. So this gives you Dragonheart, level 1, which inflicts Dragon Blight on you if you go below 50%. Now when you're Dragon Blighted, your Ice Element automatically goes down to 0, and this will cut down your damage significantly. On the flip side though, the moment you go back above 50%, Dragon Blight goes away instantly, so I would recommend you do that, if you weren't healing when you were below 50% anyways. Uh, for what it's worth, you can, if you don't like that, you can swap the Valstrax arms for the Lagombi arms, and then trade the Incog Greaves for the hunter S Greaves. All up, this will get rid of Dragonheart, and you also lose one 2-slot skill, but you'll gain two 1-slot skills. So you can get both Grinder and Ice Attack up to level 5, and have some free slots besides. And finally, the last elemental longsword is the dragon element, and the best longsword for this is the Valstrax longsword, the Red Mob Blade. So this has the wrap-up skill Wyvern Exploit, which increases raw damage to Wyverns, including Leviathans, which are called Wyverns in Japanese, uh, by 5%. This skill was actually mistranslated as Dragon Exploit until this patch, so that was a nice uh, sneak bug fix. But anyways, this longsword is the most niche of the elemental longswords because it's only really good against two monsters, and that's Rathalos and Rathian. And not even their apex forms, but you know, it exists. You have so much white sharpness here that you basically don't really even need to sharpen. Uh, if you do want, you can swap. If you do want, you can completely get rid of your speed sharpening, to be honest, and get in some free meal or something, but it's up to you. Anyways, uh, the last build just for fun is the build I use for Rampage, which is the Teostra Longsword, the Imperial Shimmer. Uh, this one is maximized, this one I spec out for max damage. I use free meal for the one slots because I am cheap. Uh, and I use the Fireblight Exploit for the ramp up, just because monsters are always fireblighted thanks to the Wild and Fire Artillery. But, yeah. And I guess while I talk about the last, uh, if you want to use the other status elements, your best bet would be to use the Rampage weapons. 
Unfortunately, they aren't very good. Uh, if you do want to use them, you do want to use the Sharpness Type 1 ramp up in your first one. With this, you only need one point of handicraft to hit wide sharpness, so then you can do a similar build to the Fin Sword builds once you do that. Um, yeah. Just a quick note that I haven't really taken into account Dragonheart and Valstrax builds in this video. Uh, I think that needs a bit more testing and I'm not too confident and I want to get this info out as soon as possible. Over the next few days I'll probably try and do some research on that, or maybe someone else will do it faster than me, hopefully. But from preliminary, like, off-the-cuff math, it seems like the Valstrax builds might be better than the Phantom Mirage Raw builds but they won't be to the dedicated elements, so those should still be accurate. So that will probably come over the next few days. But yeah, until then, thanks for watching, and happy hunting!